Hello everyone, welcome. Um, I'm kind of tempted to start playing chicken with that countdown timer. Um, the only reason it's really short is because people didn't want to wait <laughs> when they watched it back later. So um, for everyone that's online live, yeah, you get a bit of a shock because we start talking um, pretty much straight away. Um, so welcome to everyone online. Uh, for those of you that are watching this on repeat, uh, you won't be able to play along uh, and watch along. But for those of you that are uh, online, please make this as interactive as you want. Um, so that means asking questions. It means uh, checking uh, things that I say and do, because um, we're going to spend the next hour going through that program, Capture One, uh, now that I am back in the UK. Um, so <sighs> something's going weird. Something's going weird. Are we actually live? This could be interesting. I don't know whether we're live. <laughs> If we're not, let me know if we are. Um, I'm really sorry if we're not, um, but I think we are. Um, <laughs> this is kind of kind of odd. Uh, so anyway, one way or another, I think we're online. Uh, Paul is saying yes, so hopefully um, all good. We're going to spend... <laughs> something weird just happened on my system then, so really sorry. Um, we're going to spend the next hour going through that. Capture One, the raw editor for uh, your photographs. So we're going to take your raw data from your camera and we're going to process it through Capture One, which is a piece of software written by the Danish guys um, out in Copenhagen, to hopefully process and improve, or at least get back to uh, what you were expecting um, when you took the picture from where you were. Before we get going uh, into that, we're going to cover a couple of things. So, um, yes, so Paula, no, you're not from the future. It's just I got really, really confused because we do a little check uh, to make sure everything's online. But for some reason, that check didn't work. Um, really, that's the first time that's happened in, what, three years? Weird. So, um, we're going to go through a couple of things early on uh, in terms of Capture One itself and also a recap of some of the stuff that we did. And actually, this is an old um, slide. This is before we went out there. But for those of you that didn't catch up, um, there are, of course, on Capture One's own channel, the lives that David Grover and I did from across Chicago, uh, Salt Lake City, Jackson, Yellowstone, met up with Brian Creek. So lots and lots of people um uh, watching and, and playing along. There's actually a session in there where we actually do some interactivity, some audience participation, if you will. Uh, that carries on. I think that's live until the end of August, so you should play with that. That's the one that says augmented reality there. That one, um, if you're looking for it. So that one you get to play with stuff on your wall. Um, but uh, regardless of that, they're worth catching up on. We covered a lot of stuff. We also covered things like the color editor um, a little bit before that. But in this session today, we're going to be using Capture One, the Capture One version 16.2.2. Sorry. Um, so it's basically Capture One 23. If you have a version of Capture One, which is a subscription, you are entitled to be up to the very latest version at all times. You should go on to CaptureOne.com and download an update if Capture One hasn't already prompted you to do so. If you've bought a perpetual license and it's a previous version, so Capture One 22, 21, anything before that, um, you will need to upgrade if you want to be on the latest version. You don't have to. So 23 brought in some new tools, but if none of those are interesting, stick with what you've got. No problem with that. If you bought a perpetual license for version 23 after February, I'm going to look forward to the day we don't have to say this, after February, um, you're still oh, sorry. You're not going to have any updates um, because it's going to be frozen on the major release version that you had. If you bought 23 before February, you're allowed updates. I think until September, October this year. So get on it um, and get up to that latest version. This has been the first time in a little while that um, it hasn't uh, been an update between the two lives that we've done. So that's kind of cool. Um, it means I don't have to update the slide for for once. Right, uh, so that's our version done. Next thing, uh, quick things. So number one, update or uploading your files. Please uh, send them this way. So if you want us to have a look at the file in the next session, send us the raw, um, the EIP if you want. If you've got some edits on there, go to that address. Um, upload your EIP. Please tell us your name. If you don't give us a name, we're not going to edit your file. It's that simple. Um, but that means that we'll try and get it into either the next session or one of the ones coming up. Speaking of next sessions, oh, there's a lot of announcements today. Next session, uh, we're doing that one, a long exposure masterclass. So we have a whole series of masterclasses now, which are 90 minutes of in-depth stuff um, on different topics. So 
we'll cover things from um, color grading um, to cityscapes at night to night sky stuff to aurora um, and so on and the next one is going to be specifically on long exposure now we're going to go through everything on long exposure and that goes from equipment it goes to uh, what not to do in the field what to do in the field uh, it covers things like calculations that you need to know and, and certain things you need off the top of your head but beyond that, we're then going to go into the editing because there's a certain style of edit when it comes to long exposure um, photography that you've got to be really careful you don't sort of tip over the edge. So if you want to join up to that, you'll find the link in the description to this video um, just down there somewhere. Um, that's on the 15th of August. So in three Tuesdays time, three day or three weeks from today. Um, Paul, if you signed up, you won't have a confirmation yet because the confirmation goes out a couple of days before the actual um, session. But you should have a acknowledgement, but you won't have the um, you won't have the the link until just before that masterclass. But again, your choice. Um, you can go along to the live one, in which case we get lots of questions, so that's good. Um, or you can do it on a catch up later on. Um, no way, no, no worries either way. Right. Let's get into capture one. I think that's it for now. Yeah, that's all the announcements done. Emergency exits covered. So back from ooh, last time. Last time we were editing Ray's image uh, and we stopped sort of halfway. And Ray has, I think, looking through the Facebook group <laughs> that we have behind all this, um, Ray has been struggling with this image for, for quite some time. I think it's fair to say, certainly the last couple of weeks. Um, and the whole, I guess, the, the challenge with it, let's go to the original RAW. So I'm just going to, this just behind my head in here. Um, but this is the original RAW. And as you can see, I've been playing with it a little bit as well. Now, a couple of things um, with the original RAW. Uh, I'm just looking at you know, for the simple things, the simple things like a histogram. So in Capture One, obviously, you've got the option of having a histogram in the top left. There are two panels that I would always, always have pinned to the top left and remember you've got these two sections in capture one you've got basically above the thick line <laughs> this thick line here which stays where it is as you scroll the other tools and you've got below the thick line i personally in terms of my workspace will always have the histogram and the layers above the thick line because they're the two things that i'm always referencing whenever i'm editing an image histogram because as i start changing things that's our output histogram. This is what's going to come out of the printer or out onto the screen when I export. But the layers are also just as important because I see so many people, and I, I do it accidentally sometimes as well, but so many people, they're making an edit and they don't realize what layer they're on. So they think they're making a global edit, they're on the wrong layer, they're on a healing layer or something like that. So I personally would always keep your layers and your histogram up on that top left-hand um, side of the panel. If you want to add new tools, um, you're just going to right click on the um, top here, go to add tool, and then you can choose any of these ones here. And of course you can move them around, you can drag and drop, and you can move them to different tabs. So the reason I'm saying that is the first thing, as I say, I'm looking at is a histogram here. Now there's a principle which is exposed to the right. Some people subscribe to it, some people don't. The theory goes in, in very short terms, <laughs> you get a lot more data per pixel, if you will, at the higher values of the histogram than you do at the lower values of the histogram. So your signal to noise ratio effectively is greater. You're going to have more detail, more depth, more data, the further up to the right of the histogram you go. So all this space up here. And in this shot here, unfortunately, it's all down here down to the left now it's been shot at a quite a low iso down here so you've got all of your information about the shot down the bottom so iso 64 has allowed a you know it's a very clean image for sure but while there's nothing that's crushed personally i would have probably moved that exposure up a little bit 125th of a second at 50 millimeters is perfectly fine to keep it sharp, but potentially it's worth just shunting it up um, by using a bit more ISO. So maybe go to ISO 100, that would have moved it up one stop almost. Um, maybe ISO 200, um, but depending on what camera you're using, that could introduce some noise. So number one, let's try and boost it up. And so Ray was looking at specifically the light that was falling on this boat 
and up to Coit Tower and all the mist and fog out there at San Francisco. So let's move our exposure up. Now I'm not getting I'm going to turn on my exposure warning that's going to tell me in red if anything is too hot so if I push it up too much there we go we get some nice red warnings saying oh this is over. Uh, interestingly the boat out there which I think is the bit that we were trying to protect only just clips so 250 so if you look up here on the top of the screen it will give you your readout the RGB readout that's telling you the amount of uh, red green and blue data that's that's in that pixel and anything above 255 is what we call clipped so in other words there's no more data available it's gone beyond saturated so the original image this boat the brightest part of the image in fact let's go real real in is only at 140 so there's no risk of clipping it so we could have pushed it um, a little bit higher and we can indeed so we can do that with our exposure push I don't want to push it too much because if we push it too much we're going to start losing detail in the sky and, and there's a real problem when it comes to skies that are quite flat I mean we see this every now and then um, when you start to push their exposure up you lose uh, a lot of the data and a lot of the structure in there we can fix that another way so number one exposure pushed up I'm not going to push it that much I'm going to push it maybe let's go one and a half stops so remember your exposure tab here this amount here in exposure is actually in, in terms of stops so 1.0 is a doubling of light minus one is a halving of light um, so it's, it's a pretty it ramps up pretty quickly that scale but what I am going to do is use levels to stretch the histogram because exposure has pushed it from the back wall so down at the zero level up to the midtones but I can actually stretch further by pulling our shadows and I can pull our highlights a little bit brighter now we're going to be careful with that boat out there because obviously we're now pushing some of these bright parts the tiny little specular parts to be above 255 but I can rescue them by using the white slider and potentially the highlight slider to try and improve it I can back this off a little bit until we're not completely blown there we go so if I look just on it on a base level from there to there we're already in a better place in terms of seeing what's in there now the challenge is that the light's falling here, the light's falling there, we've got a pretty murky sky up there and not much of interest down in the foreground. So my temptation is, so this is where Ray ended up. I'm just going to turn that exposure warning off. This is where Ray ended up and it's... The challenge that I have is we've made such a feature of here, and I talked about this last time, um, the contrast here actually knocks out the contrast in the background. So we're going to go back to this edit here and we're going to use contrast but we're going to do it in a very selective way rather than global. So these changes have been done in the background. I'm also just going to double check on our color that we've got pro standard enabled. So this is you've got generic and you've got pro standard if your camera has been profiled by Capture One to have pro standard. So if you have it as an option I would put that on. So pro standard is enabled here. When it comes to contrast, we've got two tools. We've got clarity and we've got contrast. Those two in combination can be really, really powerful. So new layer, and we're going to call it middle contrast. Middle by location, not by nature. Um, I'm going to draw a very soft gradient mask. If you don't see a mask when you're drawing, press the M key on your keyboard. Um, and that turns it on and off. Uh, or you can click up here, little mask visibility tool, and you can choose your option. But in this case, it's the wrong way around. So I'm just going to right click, invert that mask, and now I'm going to soften it. So we've got 100% of the mask here in the middle, 50% here, zero out here. Really good. So this is the area that I want to be in contrast. So I'm going to take all of this area here, and we're then going to put up some contrast, and also put up some clarity which is going to boost those mid-tones remember a lot of the data in here is right here in the middle of the image clarity is a mid-tone adjustment slider for contrast it's great for this sort of stuff but while it's got this stuff really nicely and there's a bit of a fall off here I don't like the fact that it's picked up all of this stuff here I keep saying stuff I need to stop doing that all of this missed out here on the sea it started if I turn this off and on it started to give it that sort of gritty look 
So let's maybe have a look at our mask and I want to get rid of some of this masking out here. So if I go to our eraser, I could do it with magic eraser, but I'm just going to use a normal eraser. Right click on the screen, we can then change the size, nice and soft. I'm going to actually go for a low flow because I'm going to paint this in. And as I click, because this is a radial mask, it's going to say to me, right, I'm a radial mask. This is actually what this message means. I'm a radial mask or I'm a graduated mask. Either way, you're going to get the same message. If I change to be able to, or to allow you to erase parts of me or add parts of me, you're no longer able to edit me as a radial or as a graduated mask. So I can no longer pull up those little guides and change the shape of the radial. If I'm happy with that, I click rasterize. Now this behaves like a painted mask. I don't have those handles back to be able to change it. But what I can do now is erase. And I can do that selectively with a low flow. It means that every time I go over a spot, keeping the mouse button down or pen pressure, it's going to keep adding or erasing over that spot really, really subtly. If I turn to a grayscale mask, which is option and M, you can see the effect that's having as I'm drawing that out. I'm just going to turn that back to normal so I can see the picture. Okay. That's looking pretty good. And now we don't have so much of an impact over here on the sky. If I really wanted to get clever with it, I can right click, go to refine mask. Capture one's going to do some calculation. And it's now because I've erased the bits that I don't want, it's now forced to say, right, include the city, the peak of it in the middle, fall off towards me because I used that nice soft radial mask to come down here and ignore the sky that I've basically deleted anyway. Let's just go a little heavier on the brush flow out to here. So I want to leave a bit of that boat in. Some of Coit Tower, just so we don't notice that fall off. Remember, all we're brushing in here is contrast because it's only contrast and clarity that's changed on this layer. If you want to change the size of your brush when you're brushing, what I'm doing is pressing the square arrow keys left and right. Left makes it smaller, right makes it bigger. That makes sense. Um, once I've done this, so you can see I've done a bit more rough erasing, right? I can go and refine the mask again. So don't forget, you don't have to just do refine once. You can refine again and again and again. And what we end up with is a really nice mask of contrast. So look at that from there to there. And immediately we've just brought the viewer's attention into that middle point here. Now, Ray mentioned that there was uh, a section in here that sort of looked quite European style. So there's another thing in here, which is the image overall is quite cold. The, the, the temperature of the, the light coming in, the white balance is really cold. So overall, we might choose on the background to warm that up a little bit, maybe to there. We can counteract a little bit of tint. You could pick a, in theory, neutral gray. The problem is that if we want warm light rather than neutral light, it may be that that well, white, ba oh, sorry, white balance picker, let's just go into here uh, and pick, I don't know, let's say that this wall should be gray here or, or white. There we go. Yeah, so it's gone cold. The light was cold. If we want to warm it up, the picker's not going to help us because the picker is going to make those tones pretty accurate to what they were, which was cold at this point in time. So if we want to create warmth, we've got to ignore the picker and we've got to go for a custom white balance, custom temperature, which is Kelvin, and a custom tint, which is green to pink. So I've warmed that up. Now with the middle contrast, we could now lift our shadows a little bit be careful lifting shadows and recovering highlights because as you do that, all that contrast you've built starts to then crush. So if you think about it, contrast is, is made by separating lights and darks. If you then recover darks and recover lights, you end up back in the middle with that sort of mushy area with no real contrast. Uh, just one point. Someone's mentioned dust. Um, <laughs> Ramos mentioned dust. There is a lot of dust on here. And as Ray rightly points out, dust removal works decently except for the one on the right, which I'm guessing is that one there. So for those of you that don't know, as of 23 in Capture One, there is a dust removal tool, dust removal beta. If you don't have it, add tool. You will find it there in your little list. And if I click on remove dust, 
does a little bit of an analysis and then hopefully yep yeah, and as ray exactly says it does everything apart from the one on the right so what we're going to do is create a new heel layer and just paint onto there i'm going to choose a different source point to try and get rid of there we go an area um, so remember the dust removal tool doesn't sit on a healing layer like the old old school stuff did um right so if we go from start to where we are at the moment quite a difference already now i mentioned the skies the sky is relatively flat because of all that fog but where there is texture in there we want to get hold of some of that texture so let's just put a new layer and we're going to call it sky and i'm going to draw again a radio or sorry a gradient mouse but this time it's going to be a straight gradient and it's just going to come down to there so in other words 100 percent applied at the top 50 percent applied at the, in the middle and zero percent at the bottom so this fall off goes from 100 percent there down to 50 down to zero if i want to change the ratio i hold down the option key on my keyboard and i can expand or contract that top 100 to 50 and i can do the same with the bottom i can change that how quickly it falls off from 50 to zero so in this case we're going to do a softer fall off there that's looking pretty good. But I don't want to include Coit Tower or any of this hill. So the way that I'm going to do that is right click and I can actually force that rasterization. So if I didn't want to use the eraser to, to trigger the rasterize that I did earlier, right click rasterize mask. It's now a mask that's rasterized. If I now go to the eraser, in fact, we can use the magic eraser. And I'm going to make sure we've got a reasonable brush size, low tolerance, and just click in there. I'm going to turn on a grayscale mask so you can see. So it's removed that hill. Oh, that's a bit too much. So let's make it a bit smaller. Let's try and remove the tower. No, it's done too much. We may have to remove the tower on our own, the manual old school way. Um, let's have a look. We could use a Luma range, but this is a pretty similar tone so actually what i'm going to do is a man so you've got magic brush on the right normal brush on the left same for brush as it is for eraser and we're going to go 100 percent flow really small brush size and i'm just going to brush that out so maybe the edges are going to clip a little bit of what i'm about to do but we'll see whether it's an issue um, it's going to become very apparent if we see any haloing um now these trees here even though it hasn't quite got them. Remember that little trick? Right click, refine mask. Oh look, now it's got the trees. It has included some of the houses down here, so we might want to go back to our eraser. And let's just delete those in there. Nice. Not worried about it having the ship or out there, but this out here we do need to try and remove as much of it as possible because we don't really want it to peak with clarity or maybe we do we'll have a look in a minute that will probably do for what we need at the moment okay so with that layer done i can now go to town <laughs> with the clarity we wouldn't normally do that but we can push to see now what you've got here is fog and you've got cloud coming in that cloud tends to hang you've got strands of vapor in or water vapor in the sky we want to use that now this is the highest clarity i would ever go to um, we can use dehaze but the irony there is all that's going to do is flatten it because the haze is just providing light so we can use a little bit of it we could in theory desaturate it a bit so it's a bit yellow up there at the moment so we could take that saturation out a little bit again be careful you don't do it too much that kind of works and then overall with the image, if I go to the background, we can vignette in a little bit and I get to there. Now, if on top of all of that, I want this boat and the tower to really stand out, I'm going to need a separate layer for them. So what I'm going to do is create a new little rough layer and it is going to be a rough layer. Let's just go smaller brush, really soft edge and i'm just gonna do that there let's see if refine mask will get it see if it's clever enough mm, not quite 
Maybe if we come back a little bit. Yeah, maybe to there, apply. Right, I don't want this gray stuff though around it. So we could, in theory, go to our Luma range. And we could just pick up the lights. It's not going to quite work. Um, oh, interesting one. So if I want a Luma range that goes the bottom part and the top part, but not the middle, how do we do it? Well, I can create a new layer. Ship lights. And in here, ship darks. Some of you are going to realize what I'm going to do. Um, this was the one with our mask. This one doesn't have our mask. So here, right click, copy mask from ship darks. Luma range. So I want all the dark stuff, but none of the background. It's not going to quite get it because it's very similar, but those are the darks. Sorry, the lights got them around the wrong way. Do you know what? The easiest thing for me to do now is just rename them. <laughs> um, so the ship lights, Luma range, so all of the light stuff. And none of the mid-tones. So let's get to about there. Little fall off there. Apply. So I've now got two layers. The lights and darks of the ship, but not, in theory, the background so much. And I can pump that clarity separately on that layer. And actually what I can do is also use contrast, which will make the darker parts of the ship slightly darker. We could even pull our brightness down a little bit. There we go. So without that, that looks pretty good. Now we've got to make sure that we've done similar, not necessarily the same, on here. So while we've got clarity on the lights, we might want to protect our highlights, but also push up that contrast as well. So that's the ship. What about the tower? Well, let's create a new layer. And we're going to paint. Let's try a magic brush just to see what it does. Yep, happy with that. No, not happy with that. So we are going to undo that magic brush. Tolerance, I'm going to put this right down to one and see if it can get it. No, it can't. So what we can try is making this brush smaller. I've seen a lot of people try and do this. Yeah, so that's that may not actually be the end of the world for us because let's just try a magic eraser on a really small tolerance and just click that sky. Ah, we end up in a seesaw, which I'm not happy with. Um, so we may have to, unfortunately, manually draw this in. So we could use auto mask. I'm just conscious of time as well a little bit. Um, but let's imagine I did that perfectly. If I hadn't, then we could have done some refine edges. Right click. I am going to refine it um, just to now it doesn't need to be up here. That's going to wash it out. We want to pull probably you know 60 to 70, something like that. Um, that's going to give us all of this area covered. Now, I don't want any of this, remember. So I'm going to go to my normal eraser, make a really big brush, and just pull all of that away. Now, I don't want a dramatic fall off as I get closer to the tower, so I'm going to drop down my opacity, and that allows me to paint on in individual clicks. So every time I click, I get another 25% wiped out. If you want to see that in grayscale terms, you can see I'm effectively painting in how easily this falls off because I don't want it to be noticed. Uh, right, tower. Really simple. Clarity. Ooh, what happened there? Something... anyone notice the towers disappeared? <laughs> Let's just get back to where we were. That was weird. Redo a raised mask. Okay, I must have clicked something. So let's go um, back to our tower that's now correct. Remember as well, actually, good point. I keep forgetting to tell people this. There is an undo button in Capture One, and it undoes everything. So in other words, if you change the picture in the browser over here, it will undo that selection. If you um, go to a different layer, it will undo that. Every single step you can undo. Uh, so that's literally what I've just done. Uh, pull up your clarity there. 
that's good pull up a little bit of structure now we might want to use a bit of dehaze just on the tower there we go and again that's made it really crisp but it's too crisp for the surrounding area so back to my eraser and i'm just going to brush out some of this base stuff down here so we now have a tower that goes from there to there overall we can now go back to our background image and we can now press our levels a little bit up i'll leave the darks where they are and i would say that's probably where you're going to end up um so maybe we want to push it a little bit warmer now and that's going to be your call ray um but i'd um i'd sort of be in a place of that's that's gonna work um it's probably as far as we can push this um if you were gonna I mean, let's go to raise original one this was the sort of extreme pull of, of contrast it does work and don't get me wrong ray it's a good recovery you've, you've got all the detail back um i've tried a few and we'll, we'll talk about them in a second but if you want this to be sympathetic to that sort of feel where it's sort of a soft light a golden light um, I'd be in this place, maybe use a touch of saturation, but be really careful with that. You could use brightness, but remember that's going to flatten the image a little bit. Um, so if you do use brightness, use a bit of contrast with it. But if you want it to feel soft, yeah, you're, you're okay. Um, that's where I would be. Now, there's quite a few layers on there. There's quite a few edits. We've done quite a few edits on it. Um, but that's probably as far as you can get. If you wanted a different picture out of it, you're going to need to shoot it on a different day. There are some other options. So this is using the Blockbuster. Um, you can see on here the um, style. So we've got within, um, oop, not that one, it was under Cities. So we've got Blockbuster in our um, Cities style pack. What that's doing is taking anything that's warm and making it orange, anything that's cool, making it green. So you end up with this sort of movie sort of style look. Um, but we're talking about then styling something because it doesn't necessarily work as a pure image. Um, and at that point, you know, we, we've got this one here. I actually used a, another one of the elevation styles called Vivacity um, in there, which is which is essentially it's pulling contrast. It's almost like an extreme version of where you'd got to, Ray, um, and, and obviously a slight uh, color shift. Um, and then we've got this one, which is just Golden Hour, which effectively just softens that view. It gives you a bit of a warmer touch. But with fog, you know, Golden Hour doesn't quite work with fog. So, you know, mentally it... it you've got to make sure that it does make sense um as a as an overall um, image so i personally would probably be there the only other change i consider making is to just crop down maybe into there and yeah i mean that that works uh if certainly if i go from where we were to where we're at we've got all your your essential bits you've got you know the towers nice and clear the ship is clear with the light falling on it this little area down here is nice and bright um with warmth as well but that's that's really as far as i'd take it any more than that and we're starting to go into fantasy i think right a lot of tools in there refine mask really 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 please use refine mask it's a, it's a great tool for organizing especially around complex stuff mark <laughs> where david and i were last week i'm missing oh i'm missing david there's david um so in fact no david was just about here last week um but anyway <laughs> we stood for that exact spot uh, and david did a, a big long exposure um so this edit it, it this is a tough one um to, to talk through because this is 99 percent about style um, oh, by the way, I forgot. John, the, John, the person that won the quiz last week when David and I did the live. Your print is here. Um, you need to go back to David with your address. Um, <laughs> because otherwise it's going on David's wall. Um, so uh, this is Grant Eaton Range um, out in Wyoming. And it, this purely comes down to how you want to edit an image of the mountains. I'm going to create a new variant of it. Um, so this is out of the camera. This is the edit that Mark's done. Um, I think on Mark's edit, at, at the moment, what it's got is a lot of color into it. 
an awful lot of uh, recovery in terms of bringing shadows up, bringing highlights down, making it nice and crisp. The challenge is I don't think it's got as much drama as it needs. Um, so let's just have a look at a, an alternative edit. It doesn't mean that the original edit is wrong. It's just one that maybe I'd look at as an alternative. So first thing, straighten it up. People, please shoot with straight horizons. Um, your camera or your tripod has a spirit level. Please, please, please. Because I'll tell you why. You're wasting pixels. So look at all this stuff on the edges here. We're throwing it away. So everyone, you know, everyone goes and buys their 47 megapixel camera because it's better than the 45 megapixel camera that has less detail. And then you throw four or four million pixels away by getting it straight out in the field. And I know it can be a challenge in a hurry, but you're getting the best out of your kit. So just yeah, get get it straight. Get your get your horizons level, um, especially if it's water. If it's water, who? Um, so there's our mountain range. There is one brush that this scene just screams for, which is built into Capture One. It has been for a few uh, versions now, and it's called the Deep Sky Brush. So it's the built-in style brushes. If you don't have style brushes, it's on the left-hand side. You're going to right-click, add tool, and way down the bottom off your screen, you'll see one that says style brushes, and this will appear. You can build your own. We've got some. So we've, we've built a Traffic Trails one as part of that elevation pack. But there's also built-in ones within Capture One, and Deep Sky is the one that is designed for this shot. So I'm going to change my brush size. I'm actually going to soften down the hardness of it because I don't want it to have a transition that's obvious down the bottom. And I'm going to paint. And what we're going to see, and a bigger brush would mean that I don't risk losing any gaps, but we'll just go over that, just double check in a second. But what you're going to see is a very similar result in terms of the drama to where Mark got to, but without all the need for these layers. Because what the Deep Sky Brush is doing is all of that stuff in one go. Now, because it's created its own layer called Deep Sky, I would actually personally put in here Modified because I'm now going to change some of what that layer has done. So remember, it's still just a layer. It's just a brushed layer. There's nothing clever about it. Um, it's just a layer that's been added on, on top of the background. But I can warm up Deep Sky. It doesn't have to stay as that Deep Sky. It doesn't have to stay with its own settings that came out of the cam. We can change things. I can reduce the amount of clarity it's, it's adding in. It's adding in quite a lot. I can increase it if I want, so I can go up to there. If you go to the color editor, you'll see what Deep Sky is actually doing, which is in the advanced. It's got some changes in brightness for certain blues. And I, th I think that may be it, but there's a cutoff, I think, on the lighter ones. Yeah, so only the lighter styles get a real boost in saturation. The deeper colors or the, the richer colors don't get their saturation boosted, and that's why it's got such a strong effect up in the sky. Now, one thing that Mark did on the sky, which is, is spot on, actually, is the sky skin tone. So there is a mask along the sky here, and what Mark has done has you he's used the skin tone tool to select all of the blue and try and harmonize it across the entire image. So you don't get, like you do in here, this deep at the top and light at the bottom. So we can do the same thing across here. I'm going to just choose a midpoint in that sky. Oops, I'm actually going to create a new layer. Sorry to do that. So we're going to create a new, let's go empty. Um, and I'm just going to brush in very, very roughly. It doesn't really matter, but I don't want to get hold of the mountains. That's a fair call. So let's go with that. And I'm going to do a couple of things. So the first is we are going to do a Luma range. I'm just going to turn our grayscale mask on. So Luma range, and we're going to exclude anything that's white, which would be the clouds, right? So we're going to do that, and we're going to soften that fall off to there. That's pretty nice. A bit of a soft radius on the edge. Okay, so now we have a mask that does not include the clouds. Good. But we also want one that doesn't include the very darkest parts of the mountain. So how do I do two Luma ranges on one layer? I've only got one Luma range option. Well, right-click, rasterize. That takes the Luma range as it is. Go to Luma range. Now we can choose to exclude the darkest parts of the image. 
So let's go. Ooh, now we have a problem because actually the luminosity, and I could have checked this, the luminosity up here is 79 to 80. I'm reading the gray one up here. And the luminosity of these mountains are 80 to 86. So if I take out the top of the sky, I'm also taking out the bottom of the mountains. That's a bit annoying. So maybe I use the magic eraser. So really, really tight tolerance. Come on. There we go. So if I want to add some more down here, well, I can. I could potentially use the magic brush. Really tight tolerance again. And just going to add that in there. Add that in there. That's done a good job. Now, with all that done, I'm going to go back to that other tool, Refine Mask. The temptation with this is for everyone to have it up to the maximum because that does the best, right? No, we want detail. So even though I don't want it to be this binary, I don't want it to be completely smooth. I want it to be up to maybe I don't know, 127. That will do. Apply. So now I have a mask on the blue. So I'm going to call it Blue of Sky. It's like a title. So click in this middle bit here on the skin tone tool. And I'm going to say anything in this arc. Remember, that is also masked. It's not just using the color. It's also using the mask. So anything in that arc. Now, I can increase the saturation. I can decrease the lightness even further. So I can make it really deep. But more importantly, I can now make that uniform color uniform saturation and uniform lightness and especially look down here and up here when I pull this uniformity across I'm starting to get evening out of the sky don't do it completely because it just looks a little bit odd um, but certainly you can push it up to sort of 60s and 70s so what I now have is a, a layer that evens up and deepens the sky without affecting or affecting the mountains and without affecting the foreground in this foreground here i might want to do something just to counter the fact that these trees are actually quite dominant because the mountains aren't particularly strong so i'm just going to take this as a variant i'm going to create a new empty layer and we're going to call it tetons oops with that layer we're going to do let's try a magic brush and see whether it can uh whether it can work it out. Yep, it's done a pretty good job. Remember, I don't want necessarily to catch all of the snow stuff because that's going to punch that snow even brighter. So if I've got white snow, all that's going to do when I start grabbing that into this mask is make it even whiter, and it's also going to grab the clouds. So I'm happy with that. What I am going to do, as you can probably guess, is refine it. A little bit so we've got some nice smooth fall off i'm going to go to my normal eraser and i'm just going to get rid of this little nick across the top so 100 percent opacity 100 percent flow oops don't get too tight on it that cleans that up nice uh why have we got a little gap here it's because there's grass in there so that's okay right turn the mask off two things Number one, let's go back to our exposure tool. And we are going to use a little bit of dehaze. Number two, quite a bit of clarity. Now, as a result of using those two, we've ended up with a much cooler mountain front than the rest of the image. So again, you've got to keep things sympathetic to the rest of the shot. So let's go on to our white balance and just get it back to neutral to about there so we then go from there to there so remember as you use dehaze especially it's going to change the color tone of the image because it's removing some haze which it sees which is going to be a particular color tone so to counter that we just use a little bit of white balance you could use color editor but a little bit of white balance helps with this and then that would actually allow us just to push clarity a bit more now again this is why it's, it's a difficult one because it's his personal choice if I go to the original here, Mark's edit, there's nothing wrong with that edit. It's just, to my eyes, quite flat because of the haze that's been introduced as a result of pulling up all the shadows and the highlights. If I look at the edits that were done, um, there is some saturation stuff on there, but 
we've lifted up shadows, we've lifted up black, we've pushed down white, we've pushed down highlights. Not too much, don't get me wrong, it hasn't changed that much. But the result is what was already a, quite a flat image has then gone to even flatter, which we need to, we need to have a look at. Whereas by doing it this way, we get a much more dramatic effect, and that was literally by using the deep sky brush at the top, the skin tone tool just to clean up this, uh, or the sky graduation, and then a separate layer over these mountains just to give us an extra clarity boost. But then remember, as you use dehaze, the colors may change, so you may need to shift the white balance forward a bit. But that's where I would go with it. There's, there's nothing wrong with either shot. It's just to me, if you're talking about mountains and rugged and ragged and, you know, gritty stuff and pointed rocks and all that sort of stuff, I kind of want to see that in the mountain. I don't really want to see it obscured by haze. Um, that's where I'd, I'd be at. Uh, David, could the dehaze tool not automatically compensate for the color change? Not really, because if you look at the dehaze tool itself, it's going to either choose an auto shadow tone or you can pick a shadow tone. Unless that shadow tone effectively is gray, as it removes that tone, you can see this one, it's slightly blue. As it removes that tone, you'll, you'll actually see the image remove that color a little bit from, well, from your dehaze. So whatever it, it uses, whether it's auto or whether it's manual, if it's not dead center, grayscale neutral, unfortunately, it is going to remove some color as part of the removal of the haze. And that's going to result in an image which has shifted a little bit because all that color's gone. Um, so a couple of extra on. So Paula, could be a nice black and white. Yes, it could be. So let's just clone that variant. I'm going to create another, oh, not that one, another copy of it. And we're going to go very simply to the color tab down the bottom, enable black and white. And because I've got those deep, rich blues, remember, I've got these sliders that can control things. So there's our blue sky that's done a great job there the greens of the foreground we could lift or we could drop so we see the trees start to light up some of this foreground is actually yellow so we've got that we can darken that down or we can lighten it a little bit maybe the reds well there's not much red in there oh, there's a bit maybe in the rocks so we can lighten that up if there are any magentas a little bit in the cloud weirdly but remember again with the white or oh, sorry with the black and white tool use your color sensitivity sliders it's really really important to to use that um to get stuff back now if the result of using the black and white sliders is that you've got some crushed shadows in here which you, you kind of have um remember the black and white sliders are universal so the reason that i leave my layer thing up here is because it's a reminder at the moment i'm on the tetons layer the black and white tool doesn't matter, but the shadows and highlights one does. Now, ironically, on the Tetons, I do actually want to be on that layer to edit the shadows and highlights. And I'm going to lift our shadows up a touch and lift the black up a touch as well, which just gets us back there. But that's the black and white version. That would be the color version. Um, I'm sort of in a place where I think this one's just a bit too flat for my eyes, um, but maybe that's just my eyes. So I'd be in either there or there. Um, Tobias says, what about cropping out the foreground? Yeah, but potentially. Um, let's just have a little look. Uh, where are we? I'm going to go to unconstrained just so I can try a couple of things. So number one, get rid of just these trees. We could, of course, heal a couple of them out. Be careful with national parks, though, because some of the trees are meant to be there. <laughs> um, so we've got that option. The other option is to go right up to the tree line. But to me, that that would it is an option that works. Uh, maybe removing these two out of it. Yep, that sort of works. Uh, Joe, clarity on the foreground. Again, this is, is personal taste. Personally, I wouldn't. I want to push the viewer to look at those mountains. I want to push them to look at the the ragged structure up there, the the rock face, the ruggedness of it. That's where clarity should sit. Putting it onto the trees down here, you're you're now just distracting. So you're pulling the viewer's um, gaze effectively back from what we want them to look at um, and back down. Paula, don't go until Adam's mad. Oh. Yeah, there's a story in there somewhere. Um, so, yeah, black and white version, whether you leave the trees in or not, that's entirely up to you. Um, you know, oops, let's not do that crop. Let's do an unconstrained one. I need to work out what the actual crop ended up, but that would work. Um, 
But yeah, it's just a different edit mark. So again, nothing wrong with this in terms of if that's how you wanted the image to come out. It's just for me, I'd want it with a bit more drama. And I think both of those two do that. Uh, right, next up, uh, Michael. Let me just pull up here. And there's a question. It's actually probably a, a quick one, this one. So hopefully we can, we can answer it nice and quick. Um, and it was about using negative clarity uh, around the sun. So I can't find the layer that you've done it on. There we are, sky. So the issue is, what was it? It was Michael. So is this halo here around the sun? And you've just got to think, what's clarity trying to do and how does it work? So I've got here a mask around the sky. And what Michael's tried to do is use negative clarity to smooth out the sky. So if I try, if I turn this sky off, we get a lot more banding, a lot more lines. So using negative clarity is a great way of softening that up. The other one is to use negative contrast. Now there's a little bit in there, but we could dial in even more if you wanted to, no problem. The problem is that by using negative clarity and to an extent contrast, you get this halo around here and what's causing it. So the issue is, and you'll actually see this in other tools, so you'll see it in the deep sky brush, which uses clarity as well. As you get to the edge of a selection, unfortunately, that clarity has to make a decision. So if we look at our mask, let's just go here. The sun's been excluded, not a problem. But think about what clarity's got to work out. So all the way along here, it's saying, right, so unlike positive clarity, what that does, is it says, right, two pixels that are, are neighboring, are you brighter or are you darker? If you're brighter, get brighter than me again. If you're darker, get darker than me again. So effectively, it's stretching all those contrast points where two tones meet, split them out further. So make the brights brighter, the darks darker. That's effectively what it's doing. But what happens when it gets to the edge of a mask? It doesn't have anything to reference. So somehow it's got to effectively fall off from all the work it was doing over here and stop doing that work by the edge. And that's what you're seeing here. As that clarity or negative clarity gets to the edge of the image, it effectively doesn't know what to do. So there is a problem here, which is how you deal with that mask. Now, one way, I'm just uh, given that I've... Um, cloned that variant so again because we're editing on images we're going to right click and go to clone variant whenever we do any um, changes but because of that on this mask if I were to draw on a bit more sun You'll see it heals a little bit. It's not, not a lot, but it does help it a little bit. The other option, and this is where you have to get into visual tricks. So this is our mask at the moment because I've drawn over it. I can, remember, just with that opacity and a really soft mask, cheat. <laughs> because if you remember, this is the mask that's causing that. And I need it to fall off before I hit the border of where that sun is. But I don't want it to fall off immediately because that's obvious. So what I can do is stroke by stroke as we're painting. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> Wrong tool. Eraser. Um, we want to erase. We don't want to add. So little by little, every single click, I'm just erasing a bit more of that mask. And you'll see that halo has already disappeared. So we go from there with the halo. You can see it quite obviously around the sun to there where it's not. Now the trade-off is I've also removed some of the mask from around the sun. So you kind of go a little bit softer on that rehaze or, or um, negative clarity or whatever you want to call it. Um, and you get to a place where no one's going to notice that that mask fell off before it actually got to that border. It's the border that's causing or causing the halo. If you remove the border, all of a sudden you don't have the halo. Um, Michael, I cheated in the original edit, just not a smooth cheating. So yeah, the the way that people will tell is they can see if there's a transition. So the whole point is 
to try and do it as softly and as smoothly as possible so that no one notices and then you won't have the halo um so hopefully that answers the question michael i think it does but it's be it's one to be careful of just be really clear or careful with clarity especially on borders high contrast borders if the mask stops clarity's got to do something it's got to stop doing its work at a certain point and it's it can be quite abrupt when it gets to the edges um stuart right i'm almost tempted to run a competition here and the competition is how much do we think the saturation slider has been pushed up on this image i won't keep you in suspense it's quite a lot so if i go to our original here to there that's quite a punchy edit in terms of uh, in terms of color now this is a street uh, i think in denmark um so i i think yes the temptation is to go for the colorful houses and stuff because that's what we're typically seeing but we're normally seeing that when there's a blue sky and there's clouds and there's light and, and whatever else. On a rainy day, I don't think you quite see that level of colour. And the result is it, very, it looks very artificial because our eyes know that that wouldn't have been the scene that we saw unless these houses were painted with fluorescent paint. So there's a, you know, there's a great layer on here for sky. Um, it's done really nicely. I don't know whether it was magic brush or not. Um, but for me, this colouring is is just a bit too much. And if I go to the the sliders on here, go to our background layer, that saturation slider at seventy three. If I see one of those sliders above sort of forty, something like that, alarm bells start going off because it's a, it's pushing it a bit rich. If you really meant to, if you really wanted it um, that bright and, and rich and saturated and vibrant, fine, go for it. But I think in this case, it's a bit too much. Uh, it just doesn't sit with the weather that's up here. This light up here in this sky does not make sense to have delivered that amount of colour um, reflecting uh, down below. So, number one, I'm going to back this away. Sorry. Um, I'm also going to back away a little bit of contrast as well. And what I'm also going to do is use Auto Keystone, hopefully, to straighten up the houses. Great. So we go from this lean in, because it was shot looking slightly up, uh, to a more level, even look. The sky layer, I don't have a problem necessarily with the, the theory of it, but the saturation slider isn't doing a huge amount up here. Darkening it by that extent is a bit of a challenge because you've also, so it's, it's a weird one. We've got an exposure pull down, but on the same layer, we're then actually stretching the rest of the histogram to go brighter. So which is it we're trying to do? Are we trying to darken it with exposure or are we trying to brighten it using levels? Doing the two together, they're, they're sort of fighting, um, if anything. So I'm going to back that away a little bit. We will use clarity in the sky just to pull up the clouds, if that was the, the look that we were going for. But I am going to just back away this, this pull here on exposure. Now, this is one where you've got a choice to make. There's not much we can do about weather. But what we can do is style the image so if this is the the image that you wanted and it just doesn't feel like it's got a style or a mood to it go to the color editor so go to your color balance tool and maybe we split tone it maybe we put in some cool shadows and some slightly warmer highlights again be careful with that saturation so i might even want to back away that background saturation even more but then i've got a sort of a vintagey feel um let me just put in A, a sort of a, a, a nice yeah it's a traditional feel it's like an older photograph or something like that to a traditional street scene that's relatively flat in light that to me works just in my head this is just too much and, and when i look at these two side by side let's just create also a um an original so that one that one and that one so here is our original at the bottom this is a version that has some color toning on it. So you can see what I've just done. We've pulled down that saturation. The sky layer is good. Let's keep that and it gives you some texture in there rather than this blowout here. But that split tone, um, especially if we just pull the shadows even more to there, highlights even warmer, that kind of works. That from here feels like an edit that's natural and it, it's it's got a vintagey feel to it. This one here, I think, is just too much. It, it's just too harsh, and it, it doesn't make sense visually 
to have that much cloud and a flat sky and then these these um, houses sort of screaming their colors. So I would, personally, I would just tone it down a little bit there. So for today, that's kind of it. We've got that one from Stuart. Um, so yeah, it's just calm it down a little bit. We'll, it, it, especially bearing in mind the environment that you're shooting in. If you're shooting in flat light, it doesn't make sense that you've got this richness coming from the color. I would actually use the flat light to, to pull down something vintage and use the keystone tool um, to correct for that lean. Michael, um, when you're trying to get away with using maximum clarity, whether it's negative or positive, just fall that mask off a little bit before any borders, and that way you will avoid um, those harsh halos. And that goes for anything. It goes for clouds and skies as well. Uh, Mark, is again, so nothing wrong with this edit. It's just maybe the punchier versions um, just bring those mountains to life a little bit more. And Ray, quite extensively, um, that's probably as good as we're going to get with that one. But yeah, go back to San Francisco. There are worse places to go and photograph. Cool. So that's us for today. Um, the next time I see you lot will be on that. So if you want to join in on that masterclass on long exposure, go to the link that's down in the description on this video. Um, sorry about the start of this session. It was a bit weird because we, I wasn't sure whether we were actually broadcasting and then it took you guys to say, yes, you are. Uh, that could have been that could have been embarrassing. Anyway, um, if you want to look at previous masterclasses, they're also on the link um, down below. But between now and the next time we do editing, which will be in a month's time, um, send your raw files or EIPs into that place there. Uh, so poryforlive.wetransfer.com. We'll pick them up. We'll try and get through as many as we can during these sessions. Um, but for those of you that I don't see on the masterclass, look after yourselves and we'll see you next time. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye.